Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Rob Willis.info here, and in this video I want to talk about something that's pretty simple and straightforward but often gets overlooked when deploying a new server in an environment. And that's going to be ensuring that all of the firmwares on the chassis are up to date before you put it into production. And that's going to be because you don't want to have to reboot a server endlessly or even run into issues when, run, when updating firmwares that will cause more downtime on a production server than needed. So if you can get these things out of the way in the beginning, it's the best time to do it. So you notice that I'm already logged into my Windows 10 machine and I've got the, I'm already logged into the DRAC as well. I'm going to go ahead and power on the server and get this guy going while we talk about this a little bit more. So the kind of things that I'm talking about updating here are going to be the RAID controller, the BIOS, um, the iDRAC, uh, the, net, the network controllers or the NICs, stuff like that. And a lot of times you'll see major bug fixes are implemented into these firmware updates. So this is definitely something that you're going to want to knock out right away. So this way you don't end up troubleshooting things later on that are going to end up just being resolved by these updates. So traditionally, I've always updated my firmwares either manually or by downloading Dell's uh, SU or server update utility and deploying them that way. But I noticed with these new R610s that I picked up, they had something called a lifecycle controller, which was a new feature to me. So whereas traditionally I would require an operating system like Windows or Linux to boot into and then run SU, with the lifecycle controller, I'm actually able to just enter into the lifecycle controller directly off of the BIOS boot menu. So whereas before I'd be downloading a 7 to 10 gig ISO image onto my local Windows or Linux install, now I can just enter directly into the lifecycle controller and it'll download just exactly what is needed for the server. So you notice here that it, in the BIOS boot menu that it says press F10 to enter the system services and that's exactly what we want to do here. That's going to take you directly into the lifecycle controller. So the reason why I mentioned the size of the SU or the server update utility package is because say you have a one hour maintenance window and you go, you know, you log into Windows or Linux or whatever and you go to deploy the SU package that's been downloaded or staged locally and you end up finding that it's the wrong package. Um, now you have to go and re-download the correct package, which is going to be 7 to 10 gigs, and apply the firmware updates within that hour window. So it can really press you for time and that's something that nobody wants to do on a production machine. But as it turns out, the lifecycle controller can have its own set of issues. And that's exactly what I saw in the case of one of my R610 servers. Um, basically, the lifecycle controller was so far out of date that it wasn't compatible with the signatures that were used on the new firmware update packages. And it, it would just basically fail to download the catalog. Um, so in the case of this video, I'm actually going to show you how to do both. Uh, update the firmwares via the lifecycle controller, and hopefully that works out for you. But in case it doesn't, I'll also show you how to download the bootable CentOS image that's available through Dell, and then load the SU package directly on top of that, and manually deploy the firmware through there. This wasn't something that I originally planned on covering with these chassis, um, but ultimately became such a pain in my butt and I saw other people having similar issues online and not being able to resolve them that I figured it was worth covering. Um, but basically what I was chasing was resolving the Perk 6i kept flagging um, some cheap SSDs that I bought as bad, even though I knew that they weren't. And in this case, after the firmware updates, it still flags them as bad, but I've been able to get over that. But um, so basically at this point, I'm going to go ahead and let it let the server boot into the lifecycle controller and then we'll pick up from there. All right, so at this point, we're basically booted up into the unified server configurator here with the lifecycle controller enabled. And um, the first thing we want to do is make sure that the service picked up an IP address on the network because it is going to need to reach out to the Internet. Um, so the first thing we want to do is arrow down to the USC settings here and verify the network configuration. If you're using DHCP, it should have just automatically picked up an IP address from the network and you should be good to go. Um, if you're not running DHCP on this network, then you're going to need to go ahead and configure a static IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, and all of that stuff. This is an absolutely crucial step here. We want to make sure that we have the right NIC card selected here and that it's on the network along with the correct IP information. If the server is not on the network at this point, everything else that we do moving forward with the lifecycle controller will fail. All right, so now that we know that the server is on the network, we want to go back to the main menu here and we want to select platform update. And then next we'll want to go ahead and select launch platform update. And from there, we want to use the FTP server as a repository and then go ahead and select next down at the bottom there. 
And as far as the FTP server configuration here, you just want to stick with the defaults. It's going to be ftp.dell.com and you just want to leave everything else as the default and just go ahead and select next. And it's going to take a few moments while it goes, goes ahead and pulls in the information from that server. Now, if your lifecycle controller is too far out of date, this is where it will likely explode and say that it failed to download the catalog. So in the case that that happens, I'll actually cover exactly what you need to do to resolve that issue immediately following this step. Um, but for the sake of consistency, I'm just going to show you to what it looks like when it works normally here. But you can see that it will go ahead and download the catalog and then it should show us the results of basically what firmwares on the chassis need to be updated at this point. Alright, so it looks like at this point the server was able to successfully download the catalog and shows all of the available updates for the components that are installed in this particular system. Um, so really all we have to do is select the components that we would like to update on the left hand side here and then go ahead and click apply at the bottom there and it will update all the firmwares and reboot as necessary. So if you make it this far, you basically should be good to go at this point. Um, if it doesn't work out though, and you're not able to install the firmware this way, or you get the whole catalog failed to download and all that stuff, then you can go ahead and proceed with the next few steps that I'm going to cover here, which is going to be booting into the CentOS image and updating the server manually via the server update utility. Alright, so I'm back on my Windows 10 machine here, and let's say that the lifecycle controller failed to download the updates that you needed for your server. Um, so in this case, we can go ahead and manually update the firmwares via the uh, server update utility or SU. So we're going to have to go and download a couple files here, and the first thing we're going to do is go to the Dell support website. And we're going to have to make sure that we download the Dell server update utility, or the SUU package. And in this case, we want to make sure that we use the Linux 64-bit version, because we're going to be using a bootable Linux image and installing these uh, firmwares from there. For whatever reason, it, it, I always have issues searching Dell's website for the SU packages, so I usually just Google Dell SU, and you'll usually find the links towards the top that'll point you in the right direction. Um, but you want to make sure that you find the latest version available, so, and make sure that it also applies to the chassis that you're updating. Um, so it's going to be around a 10 gig ISO image, so I'm just, you can just go ahead and download that file, and I've already gone ahead and done that. Um, and then the other thing is that we want to go, this is also going to be on the Dell support page for the, uh, the PowerEdge R610 which will notice that they actually have a bootable live um, Linux image. And it's going to be based on CentOS, but you'll see it here, the Dell support live image. And uh, like I said, it's just going to be a CentOS 7 image that's bootable. Um, but this way, we can basically create a bootable USB using this image and then load the Dell SUU package onto the same USB drive. And then from there, we can boot the server into the Linux image and run the SU package. So obviously you want to make sure you get the correct support packages for your server. So in this case, I'm doing this on an R610 and that's why I'm on the R610 support page. Um, but so as you can see, I've already gone ahead and downloaded both ISO images and I'm going to be using a utility called Rufus to create a bootable uh, USB drive from the ISO image. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch that now and I'll have links to all this stuff down below as well as on my blog post on my website. Alright, so I've already got a 64-gig uh, USB drive plugged into the server because obviously it's going to have to be bigger than the 10-gig uh, the, the ISO image along the, with the uh, bootable Linux image size. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and select the little disk, uh, disk icon here and select my SLI22, which is going to be the bootable Linux image. And that's it. I'm just going to go ahead and click Start there and then just basically go with all the default options. I'm going to do the right in ISO image mode, the default recommended, and then I'm going to click OK to uh, acknowledge that it's going to destroy all data on the USB drive. And that's it. So Rufus will now go ahead and create a bootable USB drive from that image. Um, so I'm going to give this a few minutes to uh, complete here, and then we'll pick back up once it's completed. All right, so at this point, we have a uh, it's just about finishing up, and we should have a bootable USB drive that we can just take and stick directly into the server and then go ahead and boot into the, uh, the Linux image from there. Um, but before we do that, we want to go ahead and put the SU package locally onto this USB drive, so that way we can just call it locally and install all of the firmwares from there. Um, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and go back to my... I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull up File Explorer here. And um, so the first thing we want to do is... Um, let's go ahead and take a look at my computer real quick and we'll see that the uh, the USB drive should now show up and there we see it in the uh, the bottom right there but we have the uh, the USB drive that we just created using Rufus and it should have the file system of the ISO image for the uh, the bootable Linux 
but the, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is right click and create a new folder and I'm just going to name it SUU for our server update utility and then go ahead and click out of there. Alright, and so the next thing we want to do is take our suit image that we downloaded earlier and since I'm on Windows 10 I could just right click and mount it. But if you don't have Windows 10 you could use something like 7-zip and extract that ISO image. But I want to go inside there and select all of the files for the suit image and I want to basically just copy and paste them directly into the suit folder that I created on the new bootable USB drive. Now, like I said earlier, this image is huge. It's around 10 gigs, so it's going to take a few moments for this to complete. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead to once it's done. All right, so this thing is just about done. Um, but just to recap what we did here, we created a bootable USB drive using that live Linux image downloaded from the Dell website. And then we also mounted and extracted all of the files from the server update utility image and then copy and pasted them directly into a folder on that same bootable USB drive. So at this point, we have a, a bootable USB drive that we can stick into the server, boot into the live Linux image, and then go ahead and call the SU packages directly from there. Um, so that's it. So at this point, we're basically ready to move forward with doing exactly that. We can kind of close out of everything, um, pull the USB drive out of the server, out of this uh, machine, and go ahead and stick it directly into the server. All right, so at this point, I've gone ahead and pulled the USB drive out of the Windows 10 machine that I've been working on, and I inserted it into the R610 that I'm going to be doing this setup on. Um, and then I've also gone ahead and logged into the, uh, the track for the server already. So really, at this point, all I have to do is power on the server, make sure I enter the BIOS boot manager, and uh, select the, the proper USB drive to boot from, which is going to be the one that we just created. So I'm going to go ahead and power on the server now, and then I'll skip ahead to where, uh, where I'm picking on the drive, because it's going to take a few moments for the server to boot up here, and um, then we'll pick up from there. Alright, so we're finally at the BIOS boot manager menu here. I'm just going to go ahead and arrow down to the hard drive C, and I want to go ahead and make sure that I pick the bootable USB drive that we just created. And I'm just going to hit enter, and then let give it a few minutes for that to boot up and launch into the uh, the Linux-based image. So I'm just going to go with the uh, the default here, the uh, Linux-based diagnostic tool set, and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm just going to give this a few minutes to boot up, and we'll pick up from there. So at this point, it's going to work just like any other bootable Linux image if you've ever used one of those before. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, oh, let's go ahead and exit out of this real quick. We don't need no GNOME help. Um, but basically at this point, we just got to figure out where the files are going to be on this file system. So let's take a quick look at the, uh, the local hard drives. And give it a second to come up here. Um, but we see the, uh, so it's mount disk SDA1. And let's go ahead and click inside there. And then this part should look familiar here. And we see that it's the file system that we created on the Windows machine here. So there's our SUU folder. So then with inside here, there should be all of our SU packaging. And yep, it's all there. So we see mount disk SDA1 SUU. And that's going to be the path that we want to use to uh, launch the SU installer. So let's go ahead and pull up the GNOME terminal real quick here. And this is where we're going to run all of our commands from. Alright, and so now once that's up, I'm just going to go ahead and change directory real quick, or CD, into the directory that I just pointed out. So it's going to be slash mount disk SDA1 slash SUU. Alright, so the next thing we want to do is just a basic ls-l, and let's see what's inside of this directory. So it looks like the uh, suu is going to be the one we want to run here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and make this full screen real quick, and then do a dot slash suu. And uh, that should take us directly into the, uh, the suu application. And you know what, I'm also going to do a dash help, so we can see the help information, see what options are available for this application. And uh, also, it looks like it actually requires elevated permissions. So let's go ahead and throw a sudo in front of that. So I'll just sudo dot slash suu and then the dash help. And we should see the help information returned there. All right, and we should see in a second here it returns the, uh, the help information. Now, there's some important options to note here. You see there's a dash GUI or a dash G for the GUI, um, a dash U for update. It'll match all firmwares on the chassis to what's in the repository. So it could either upgrade or downgrade depending on which, you know, which what firmwares are available and what versions you're at. Um, there's also the dash E for the upgrade only, dash N for downgrade only, and the dash C for comparison. So let's go ahead and do the dash C option here. And this will compare what's on the chassis to uh, what's in the repository on the SUU package that's on the USB drive. 
So I'm going to run this the exact same way. I'm just going to do a sudo dot slash suu and then dash c. And I'm going to go ahead and give it a few moments to come back and see what our results are. In this case, it should be mostly up to date because I've already patched this system. Um, but let's go ahead and see what it returns. So while that's doing that, one other thing I want to mention is why did I end up doing this from Linux rather than just booting into Windows and using the SU package from there? Um, I actually couldn't get any of the Windows packages to work whenever the, uh, the lifecycle controller would not work on this one. Um, so that's why I ended up going this route. Plus it was an excuse to try out the, uh, the Dell bootable CentOS image because, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, so this was actually the only way that I could get this chassis to update was to do it from Linux with the Linux SU package. And yeah, so. so I'm gonna go ahead and let this thing collect the inventory here. It should come back with nothing, but we'll see what it has and then we'll go from there. All right, so this thing should be just about done here. And yeah, so as expected, there's no software updates available for this system. Um, but say there were, um, this is where you would basically just run the same exact command, the sudo dot slash su, and this time I would use the dash e for the upgrade only option. And, uh, and then it'll upgrade all the firmwares that are available. So this is also how you would upgrade the lifecycle controller whenever it fails to download the catalog when you're trying to do the updates all just purely through the lifecycle controller. Uh, so this is how you could resolve that issue. Just use the dash E option and upgrade everything that's available. Um, one other thing I want to mention here is that if you're doing this over the DRAC, you want to run this command and then you'll verify that the, uh, the actual firmware updates start taking off and then exit out of the DRAC immediately because you don't want the DRAC to be in use while it attempts to patch the DRAC stuff. So, um, so yeah, if you're going to patch the DRAC, make sure that you, you know, kick off the process and then exit out of the DRAC immediately. And uh, so I think that's where I'm going to wrap this one. I uh, hope this gives you guys an idea of, you know, a few ways that you can patch your Dell servers and make sure that all of your firmwares are up to date. And uh, if you have the lifecycle controller available and it works out for you, great. It's an awesome process and it's very easy to use. And I definitely recommend going that way. Um, but just in case you run into issues like I did with one of my R610s, um, using the, uh, the old school traditional SUU package is also a great way to ensure that you can still get them up to date, as well as fix the lifecycle controller if you're having issues with it in the uh, the signatures like I saw and uh, yeah so uh, and obviously this is something that like I said you want to make sure that you do on every server before you put it into production um, but so as always I thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time